Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome, friends. Uh, welcome to another quick and fun YouTube video from SMNP Reviews. My name's Paige. I am one of the NP facilitators on the team. And today I want to talk with you guys about how we can break down and dissect those difficult test questions, practice questions, as simply and easily and as pain-free as possible. So let's dive in. Okay, so before we jump into a few practice questions, I want to start by saying that practice questions are critical for your exam prep. We like to see at least 1,000 practice questions under your belt before testing. This sounds like a lot, but if you incorporate this as a habit early in your studying process, you're going to hit 1,000 questions in no time. Also, I want to add in that it is generally a good idea to utilize two different question banks just for some variety in your studying and to get exposure to different styles of questions. You are going to see duplicates of concepts on your exam from your practice questions, full stop. The reality is the more questions you do, the more exposure you're giving yourself, the more likely you are to see familiar concepts repeated on exam day. So also these practice questions, it's exercise for your brain so you can move quickly and efficiently through your exam and practice eliminating answer choices confidently. This is gonna help you combat that mental fatigue on exam day. So let's touch on some basic test taking strategies. First of all, I want you guys to throw out those absolutes. Absolute language like always, only, never, all, etc. So options with absolutes are usually incorrect options. Rarely are situations for our patients or in healthcare in general absolutely clear, okay? On, on the other hand, general language that allows for the exception to the rule because it's very rare for things to be totally black and white, like we said before. Um, these general words are more likely to be the correct answer choice. So examples of that, generally, probably, often. Okay, now pay attention to this, guys. Opposite answer choices. Those usually, one of those will be your correct answer choice. Um, another thing to keep in mind, A is the least popular answer choice statistically. So if you're in a pinch, this is just something to keep in the back of your mind. We do always recommend you go with your gut answer, but if you truly just have no earthly idea, keep it in mind. Okay, a few more that we can touch on. Don't change your answers. Just don't do it. Make a choice, stick with it, move right along, continue testing. Next, don't let zebra questions fluster you. If you've never heard of this diagnosis or scenario in your test preparation or your nursing practice, it's likely not even going to count towards your score on the exam. This is more than likely a throw out question. Okay, and I want you all to read the question once, reread as needed, then reread that final question. Eliminate the fluff within the question. Sometimes with these longer questions, it's better to just read from the end to begin with, just to help you cut through the fluff in the body of the question. So let's say you see a big fat exam question pop up on your screen. It's a lot to weed through. I want you to straight jump to the end, read that last sentence, see what they're even asking you. You may find that you don't need all the information that's being presented to you in the question. Reading the last sentence first will help you hone in on what is actually being asked and it's gonna help you confidently eliminate distractions, not just in the question, but also in the answer choices. Okay, one more little note here before we actually dive into some questions like I promised. Lots of these practice questions are gonna have layers, which we will talk about more today. It's not just gonna be a straight recall question with an obvious answer usually. You're going to need to have foundational knowledge of these rationales. And that is why it's so important to incorporate questions into your studying from day one. The more you practice eliminating and gaining confidence on the why behind your rationales, the easier your exam day is going to be. Okay, so let's get into it. 
So we have a 33-year-old female patient who was recently diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, and is visiting the clinic today for guidance and education about her new diagnosis. Which of the following statements would be inappropriate to include in teaching for this patient? A, it's recommended for you to utilize sunscreen whenever spending time outdoors to avoid the potential for a lupus exacerbation. B, lupus is known to potentially affect many other organ systems and frequently damages the kidneys. We will monitor your renal function closely. C, lupus is characterized by its swift progression. There are no remissions and exacerbations and instead symptoms gradually worsen over time. D, lupus may present with a wide, a variety of vague symptoms and signs. Therefore, we ask that you follow up anytime a new symptom pops up, just in case. So I wanted to include this question because first of all, we're looking for what would be inappropriate. Your brain might miss that word and jump to an answer choice that's actually appropriate guidance to give our patient, which in this case, three out of the four answer choices are actually going to be appropriate. So remember, we're looking for the inappropriate choice. It could be easy to miss this one if you didn't read slowly and properly. Secondly, we have an option with absolute language. Remember, never, always, none, no. And I want to demonstrate this concept to you guys. Let's break this down and work our way through it. So let's start eliminating some answer choices. Sun exposure is known to exacerbate lupus. It's recommended that lupus patients utilize sunscreen to prevent an exacerbation from occurring. So option A is correct. So let's eliminate that. Remember, we want the incorrect option. In addition, lupus is known to have a various effects on the entire body. Oftentimes it's the kidneys that are affected. Lupus nephritis occurs in about up to half of all lupus patients. So that would eliminate option B. It's also correct, and that's not what we're looking for. Option D is interesting. Uh, it starts by saying lupus may present with vague symptoms, so we should follow up anytime anything pops up, just in case. The first part of this question is correct. Lupus often has vague presentations, and the second half of the question, it's actually great advice. It's not telling the patient to emergently go to the ER or anything dramatic like that, uh, but just to follow up and make note of the new symptoms to their provider. This is great advice to give someone who's been newly diagnosed, especially since we can provide reassurance to them as new symptoms present and change over time. So that's correct. Let's eliminate option D also. Now, let's move on to option C. Lupus is characterized by the fact that it goes through remissions and exacerbations. So this answer choice is just flat out incorrect. Also, it says there are no remissions and exacerbations. Pay attention to that no. Even if you didn't know if this was correct or incorrect, the fact that we're telling a newly diagnosed patient that there will be absolutely no remissions and exacerbations and that their symptoms are just gonna get worse with time, diagnoses are rarely one size fits all. So that's why we tell you that usually an answer choice with absolute language, never, no, always, it's usually gonna be an incorrect answer. Disease processes are often complex and will present differently from patient to patient. So we want to avoid absolutes and allow some wiggle room in how we describe the disease to our patients so they don't get unrealistic expectation. So that means our answer choice is C. Lupus is characterized by its swift progression. There are no remissions and exacerbations and instead symptoms gradually worsen over time. Okay, let's jump along to our next question. So the nurse practitioner is seeing a 70 year old woman in the clinic today with concerns for a broken wrist. She denies any trauma to the area, but notes she woke up this morning in significant pain. You obtain an x-ray and, and note a distal radius fracture. What current medication would warrant further investigation at today's visit? Is it A, omeprazole, Prilosec, B, Pioglitazone, Actos, C, Chlorthalidone or Thalatone, or D, Amlodipine or Norvasc. So this patient is presenting to you with a non-traumatic wrist fracture, which is very concerning for osteoporosis. I selected this question because there's a big distractor in the answer choices that I wanted to highlight. 
Immediately, you may remember that PPIs, when used long-term, can contribute to bone density loss, along with Depo-Provera and SSRIs also. But there's something else that jumps out in the answer choices. Thiazide diuretics like chlorthalidone or thalatone may actually improve bone density as they stimulate osteoblasts to build up bone. So perhaps your brain went ding, 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 ding when you saw chlorthalidone as an answer choice because your brain associated the drug with osteoporosis in some way. But don't let that distract you. We're looking for the answer that warrants further discussion. What could be a problem for this patient? The more questions you do, the more rationales you read, the more familiar you'll be with this content, and you will be able to solidly eliminate distractors like this without second guessing yourself. So we need to focus in on that long-term PPI use and its contribution to bone density loss. And this should be discussed at today's visit to determine if it's appropriate for her to continue or if we do need to make some changes. So that would mean our answer choice is A, omeprazole or Prilosec. Okay, moving right along. Here's another question. A 49-year-old female patient presents today for follow-up of her recent lab work. Her past medical history includes frequent urinary tract infections, coronary artery disease, and the use of tobacco products on a daily basis. Her hemoglobin A1C is 8.9%. How should the nurse practitioner proceed? A, prescribe metformin or glucophage after ordering a renal function panel. B, prescribe glipizide or glucotrol due to its impact on insulin secretion. C, prescribe canagliflozin or invoclana due to the patient's cardiac history and risk factors. D, initiate lifestyle interventions such as exercise and diet modifications. So we have to know some background information about these drugs and answer choices in order to properly answer this question. Immediately, your eyes might jump to the answer D, initiate lifestyle interventions, which is absolutely correct. We do need to initiate those, but don't let this throw you off. This patient's hemoglobin A1C is 8.9%. She has diabetes, full blown, full stop. Lifestyle interventions are not enough to treat our patient. So it's not fully the best answer choice, so we can eliminate it. Also, we can look at option B. This patient is close to requiring insulin with an A1C at that level. So the oral glipizide is not gonna be our best bet for the effect that we wanna see in this patient. Plus, we also need to consider those pesky side effects that sulfonylureas can bring on. So this wouldn't be our go-to in this situation. So that leaves us with A and C. Now C is interesting because canagliflozin is an SGLT2 inhibitor, which is cardioprotective, which we love, but big but here, we need to keep in mind based on how this drug works, it's going to increase the risk for urinary tract infections, which this patient already has had frequently. So she's really not a great candidate for that drug. So let's eliminate that, which leaves us with one option. So the answer is answer choice A, prescribe metformin glucophage after ordering a renal function panel. So metformin is a great, cheap, safe drug to use in managing diabetes. A renal function, function panel must be ordered to monitor the patient's GFR while they're on their medication, so we would wanna go ahead and do that first. Practice questions are just as important as your review course and the materials that you use to prepare for exam day. The more of these questions you do, the easier and quicker the exam will move when it's time for you to test. We are all rooting for you. You can do this. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed.